morning. It's Matthew 14, 22, 22 and on. Uh, I'm kind of backing up a little bit. And straightway, Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him onto the other side while he sent the multitudes away. Uh, in, a, in another uh, gospel, it talks about how the crowd was so <laughs> excited about being fed by him that they were going to take him by force and make him king, which was not what Jesus it was, wasn't in Jesus's plans, wasn't in God's plans. You know, Jesus was down here to uh, redeem mankind, and he knew he, his destination was the cross. He had to be crucified and raised as a new creature. New creature. Well, we're new creatures in Christ, uh, as in uh, first. Corinthians 5.17 or is it 2 Corinthians? I always get those mixed. It's either 2 Corinthians 5.17 or 1 Corinthians 5.17. Uh, that we're new creatures in Christ, those those who believe in Jesus Christ. Uh, and he was, he was raised by God as a new creature, a new kind of creation. And they wanted to go ahead and make him king, which is getting a little ahead of himself. So that was one reason he was breaking up the crowd instead of, uh, and sending the, sending the disciples away. So, and then he, uh, and when he, he, and when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them walking on the sea. Now the watches are worth in three hour increments and watches of the night would, so that would be from sundown for three hours, then three hours, then three hours. And then the fourth watch would be the last three hours. So this was sometime between three and sunrise in the morning or three o'clock and six o'clock is a good way to Kind of keep it in your head, uh, but it's really measured from sun sundown uh, in three hour increments. So, and then he is walking on the sea. So this is uh, for me the certain miracles for me, or when I read them in scripture, I kind of go, yeah, I can see how that works. I can see how it works. I can just it just doesn't challenge my my mind i guess but some some miracles like walking on water <laughs> how does that work <laughs> i'm not too sure if you, that's the way you guys are or not but it sure is the way that i i am so i always sit there going how's how do how do you work walk on water yeah it's it's, it's got to be something solid you know you, you, at first i think you know yeah and plus you got waves because this is a storm going on so it's not like he's walking on a flat surface. There's a lot of waves going on. So how's he walking on water? Now, there's a, I've seen these images of, uh, or this device that somebody invented. It's a, like a walkway that you can put out into the ocean. Surfers love this because then once they come in from surfing, they can grab the board and they can just run out on this walkway that goes out into the ocean. And it follows the waves uh so it's so i'll see if i can find a video of it and post it in there so was jesus walking on the water like that or was he walking on the water where the waves were you know would go up to his knees and then down to his ankles up to his you know how how does that work i don't know but that just like there was a the law of plenty that i talked about last time um there's also the law which I was called part of attributes last time, but it's really a, a better name for it, the law of like. Uh, and the law of like is where objects or things in this world will take on qualities of other objects in this world. And we got some examples of this. And... Well, first, there's an example of multiplication. 
This is in 2 Kings 4. Let's do that one first. Uh, now, there, now there cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets unto Elisha, saying, Thy servant, my husband, is dead, and thou knowest that my servant did fear the Lord, and the creditor is come to take unto him my two sons to be bondmen. Now, a bondman, when you owed a debt, you could sell yourself to a person as a servant. This was kind of like what they did for welfare, but it was also a way of getting rid of debt. You would become a servant for somebody, uh, a slave, for a period of seven years. Now, that person had to take care of you. He had to feed you and, and clothe you and house you. But you had to do work for him. You had to do whatever he said. You were, his, you were his slave, but it was for seven years. And after seven years, you were free. So this is what was going on with these two guys. Uh, this guy, uh, the creditor, was coming to take her two sons to be bondmen. And Elisha said unto her, What shall I do for thee? Tell me, what hast thou in the house? So Elijah's trying to, Elisha is trying to find out what this woman has in her house that that has some value and he's thinking, well, okay, she's got something in her house with value. And then whatever she has of value, we can multiply it because the prophets and the sons of prophets taught the sons of prophets, the laws of the kingdom and, and the law of faith of believing in things in faith. That was, that's the purpose of the school was to raise up prophets and to teach them, how to be how to be prophets. So uh, let's just continue on. And thine uh, in the house, and she said, Thine handmaid hath not anything in the house save a pot of oil. Then he said, Go, borrow thee vessels abroad of thy neighbors, even empty vessels. Borrow not a few, and when thou art come in, thou shalt shut the door upon thee and upon thy sons and shall pour out all those pour out into all those vessels and thou shalt set aside that which is full so she went from him and shut the door upon her and upon her sons who brought the vessels to her and she poured out and it came to pass when the vessels were full that she said unto her son bring me yet a vessel and he said unto her there is not a vessel more and the oil stayed then she came and told them the man of God, and he said, Go, sell the oil, and pay thy debt, and live thou and thy children of, of the rest. So when she sh she shut the door inside, through faith, Elisha brought the kingdom of God into that area. So kingdom laws were in effect, and there's the law of plenty was in effect. So there was plenty of oil. So you kept on pouring out oil from, from her vessel. The oil kept on multiplying until she didn't, she had filled up all the vessels. Now if she could have found, found more empty vessels, she would have had more empty, more, more oil. So the more empty vessels she could have found, the better, the better it would have been for her. So she, she paid off her debt and then she had something to live off, live off of. So. That's an example of uh, the law of plenty from the kingdom. The laws that, I, that I've that i recognized or that I think are there are the law of plenty, the law of like, the law of personal, personal time zones. <laughs> you have your own personal time zone. Time flows. It's not true that there's no time in heaven. It's just that time flows at whatever rate you want it to flow at personally in heaven. And you can see evidences of that and uh, with, uh, was it Elisha or Elijah? I'm getting those confused. I think it was Elijah. Elijah. Yeah, he beat, he ran, outran a uh, <clears throat> chariot, the king's chariot to a place. And was it because he was running fast or was it because his, he had, was in a zone of time that, proceeded slower or faster than than the other, than the king's time uh, is an, exa an example of that there's a, also an example in star uh, star trek a star trek movie where picard is on a planet and 
the people that live on that planet have a, a way of controlling how fast time goes and they're he's sitting there talking to a girl a woman that he's had an affection for and and talking about how much she's enjoying the moment and she said well we can make it last longer and all of a sudden you know you see things that are floating by i think it was water or something like that it's going by real slow well, it was the same thing with with time and heaven uh or heaven heaven time the way time works in heaven and you can see evidences of that in in scripture too where the sun stood still and i always figured how does that work Sun stood still for a battle so that they would have plenty of daylight to to finish the battle. Uh, at first you think, oh, well, he made, God made everything stand still except for what was going on down there in the battle. But if you think about it, it's really kind of like the reverse. It was like time within the bubble of that battle was sped up so that it looked like the sun was not moving. The way, the way I look at it, that makes more sense to me than stopping the universe for for a battle to take place. But so you can think of it as, as pockets of time that are that progress in different different uh, uh, different speeds. Uh, okay, let's go to another one. Uh, let's see. This is uh, Exodus fifteen twenty two through twenty six. So this is the law, uh, example of the law of like. So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea and went out into the wilderness of Shur, and they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. And when they came to Mara, they could not drink of the waters of Mara, for they were bitter. Therefore, the name of it was called Mara. <laughs> so Mara means bitter. So that's why they called it that. And the people murmured against Moses, saying, this is the beginning of when the people murmuring against Moses. They did a lot of that during their 40 years in the desert. Uh, murmured against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? And he cried unto the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree, which when he had cast into the waters, the waters were made sweet. There he made for them a statute and an ordinance, and there he proved them. Uh, this is second Kings four uh, thirty eight 38 through 44. And Elisha came again to Gilgal and there was dearth in the land and the sons of the prophets were sitting before him. And he said unto his servants, set on the great pot and see pottage for the sons of the prophets, uh, sons of the prophets. These guys are learning to be prophets. They're, they're, uh, and one went out into the field to gather herbs and found a wild vine and gathered thereof wild gourds, his lap full, and came and shred them into the pot of pottage, for they knew, for they knew them not. So they poured out for the man to eat, and it came to pass as they were eating of the pottage that they cried out and said, O oh man of God, there is death in the pot. So they, the pot's been poisoned by some kind of poisonous plant. Uh, a man, man of God, there is death in the pot, and they could not eat thereof. But he said, then bring meal. And he cast it into the pot, and he said, pour out for the people that they may eat. And there was no harm in the pot. So the poison took on the attributes of the meal, which is good for you. The meal is good for you. Uh, the poison, poisonous plant is not. So the poisonous plant took on the properties of of the meal but it all has to be done by faith it's not it's not magic it's just it's the faith that you're believing that the kingdom laws are in effect is what what got what got it done for for them in these cases and that's what it, it's what way it works for us too so we know that a good example of this in the new testament is where jesus told the disciples to go Heal the sick, cast out devils, raise the dead, cleanse the leper, and tell them the, the kingdom of God has come nearer to you, or the kingdom of heaven has come near unto you. And the reason he was saying the kingdom of God has come near unto you is because what was they were doing, healing the sick, raising the dead, casting out demons, that all, all had to do with the, the effect of the kingdom of God being near to, near to them. So this is the same type of thing where... The prophets would bring the kingdom near 
Okay, here's another one. This one, this was a law of multiplication. And there came upon a, and there came a man from Baal Shalisha. This is from verse 42 of the same chapter. And brought the man, and the chapter is chapter four. So we're in verse 42. And there came a man from Baal, Baal Shalisha and brought the man of God bread of the first fruits, 20 loaves of barley and full ears of corn in the husk thereof. Now the, the feast of first fruits is one of the, one of the seven feasts. And it was fulfilled when Jesus ra raised, was raised from the dead on a Sunday. And there were a bunch of other people that were raised from the dead on a Sunday. They were what you would call first fruits, but first fruits, that was first fruits of resurrection. This is uh, first fruits in the celebration though, is you bring the first fruits of your harvest. So this guy brought, brought his first fruits of his harvest and it was bread of the first bread made from the first fruits, 20 loaves of barley and full ears of corn and the husk thereof. And he said, give unto the people that they may eat. And his servitor said, oh, what should I set this before it? A hundred men. So he's, he doesn't have near enough for a hundred men. And he's been told to set in, in front of him. He said again, give the people that they may eat for thus saith the Lord, they shall eat and shall leave thereof. So he set it before them and they did eat and left thereof according to the word of the Lord. So they, the, the, that amount of food was enough for them. So there's a law of plenty in effect. And this is second King six, four through seven. And when they came to Jordan, they cut down wood, but as one was felling a beam, the ax head fell into the water and he cried and said, alas, master, for it was borrowed. And the man of God said, where fell it? And he showed him the place and he cut down a stick and cast it in thither and the iron did swim. Therefore said he, take it up to thee and put it, put out his hand and he took it. So the, uh, this was the law of like where he took the stick which floats and he throws it into the water and the ax head through faith, the, the attributes of a stick floating was transferred to the ax head and the ax head floats. So it's the, the law of like. Okay. So let's go back. Now we're walking on this. Jesus is walking on the sea. How does he walk on the sea? I think it was, I'm sitting there thinking it's probably the law of like, where he says, okay, see, be like the bottom that you're on. So it's, he was walking on the sea, but the water was acting like the bottom that the water was resting on. So it would be kind of like walking on in shallow water. So he would like be like a, uh, a foot of water. And then underneath the foot of water is solid water, water behaving like land that it's resting on. It's just the way I'm thinking. I'm not saying, I'm not trying to teach this as a doctrine as something that you have to believe. I'm just saying that there is kingdom laws. There are kingdom laws that's, that can't be argued. And you, through faith, we have access to that kingdom. So if you use your faith for a certain reason for healing, praying for somebody, for them to be healed, uh, praying for uh, uh, prosperity, and I'm talking about prosperity preaching. I'm not talking about getting rich. I'm talking about like what happened with the widow. The widow needed money, to keep her sons from being made servants. So the prophet intervened for her and caused prosperity for her. It wasn't a prosperity that made her rich, but it was a prosperity that, that solved her problems. It's the same type of thing that you can pray for people. Um, Let's keep going. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. And they cried out for fear. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I. Be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, Come. And when Peter was down on the sh and Pe when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid and began to sink. He cried, saying, 
Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? Now, whenever you read doubt in scripture, and it's really true here too, doubt is the word in the Greek double mind. It means to think two different ways. So in this case, Peter was walking on the water and he was keeping his eyes on Jesus and he was in faith. He was believing, but then he saw the waves and he started thinking two ways. He was thinking on faith, but he was also thinking these waves are, could kill me. <laughs> and I'm walking on water. What am I thinking? So it's called double thinking. And you can read about that in James. But before I get into this, let's rewind just a little bit. Jesus, a lot of people, when they read this, they think, okay, Jesus is walking on water. That's not a big deal. He's God. He can do anything he wants. But you got to you got to keep in mind that Jesus is, you got to renew your mind that Jesus walked down here as a man. He is God. He, but he walked as a man, as you can see in Acts 10, 38. Let's, uh, let's go there and read it one more time. Acts 10, 38. On how he walked down here. Acts 10, 38. How God anointed, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power and went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil for God was with him. So is that's how God walked down here. I mean, how Jesus walked down here. He walked as a man, not as God. So he walked as a man in right relationship with God. Now, if you look in James, James 1, 8 and James 4, 8 talks about some interesting attributes of doubting. And he's, here he's talking about prayer. But let uh, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and abradeth not, and it shall be given him. So if you ask God for something, he's going to give it to you. But let him ask in faith, not wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with wind and tossed for let not that man think he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. It's the same word for doubt. A doubting man is unstable in all his ways. So a double thinking man, a man who double thinks, he thinks one minute he's in faith and believing that he's going to receive and another minute he's, oh, I don't know if Jesus, I don't know if God's going to answer my prayer. So that's doubting. That's thinking that. So you're not going to get from God if you doubt that he's going to give to you. And if you don't believe he's going to give to you, if you have, uh, if you've got the idea, Father, if it be your will, give me something. You're, you're already in doubt. So your, your prayer is not, you're going to have a struggle to get your prayer answered. Uh, so let's go to Acts 4, 8, no, no, not Acts, James, James 4, 8. Uh, where is it? James 4, 8. Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. So how do you get undouble-minded. Un well, he's just telling you right there, purify your hearts. Draw near to God. So put your attention on God and he will draw nigh to you because it takes, you've got to move first and he follows. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners. So that means the sinning that you know that you're doing, stop doing it. And purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Purify your hearts. Start thinking right in your heart who you are. If you're if you're a born again Christian, you're a son of God. You need to th start thinking about who you are, not who you were. You're not a sinner saved by grace. If you've accepted Jesus as your Savior, you're not a sinner saved by grace. You were a sinner who was saved by grace. Now you're a son of God. Now you're a saint. So you need to 
to get your mind renewed. So if you're if you're renewing your mind, you're purifying your hearts. So that's what you're, that's part of purifying your hearts. You double minded. So when you do that, you end up getting rid of your double mindedness. All right. Uh, we'll go back. Okay, we'll go back to it. Uh, oh yeah. Well, I, I did want to mention that fear is the enemy of faith. When you start fearing, it short circuits faith, and faith doesn't work. This same thing with doubt. Doubt short circuits faith. And you can see this if you ever when when you go out and start praying for the sick. Um, and it, the, you can see this in, in the, if you go looking at these YouTube videos of these people that can pray for the sick and they teach about it. They'll talk about how if they don't do it regular, this is how they, they, they talk. They say, if I don't do it regular, then the first time I go out to pray after a while, the first people I pray for, nothing happens. And I have to get into a rut. They say I have to get into a flow of it. But what it is is when they first go out, they're actually are walking as they used to walk. So they're walking and there's a fear factor involved because you have a fear of man. So when you approach somebody to ask for, to pray for them, the, there, there can be some fear there if you're not prepared properly. So when you pray, you're not really praying in faith and you can have a short circuit and it doesn't work. But if you go and usually what happens is if you end up praying for somebody and then, they they usually are very appreciative that you're praying for them. Sometimes they're not. Most of the time, I say ninety percent of the time they are. They they're just flabbergasted that you would there's somebody that would want to pray for them, and that make, that gives you into the spirit. And then so the next person you come up to, you're you're not afraid, and then it starts working. So the trick is to not be afraid in the first place. <laughs> so anyway. Fear is the enemy of faith, and so is is doubt. Okay, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? Now, you, a lot of people kind of can be, did I set my watch and going? Seems like it's been a half an hour. Oh, I got a minute, 51 seconds. Okay, we're doing good. Uh, o thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? Now, a lot of people criti criticize Peter because he's, he ended up sinking, but he was the only one out of the boat, folks. <laughs> Everybody else was in the boat. Now, can you imagine? Put yourself in his shoes. Imagine it. You're in the boat. Jesus is out on the water, and you say, call me. Let me come out to you. And he says, yes. Now, you're going to crawl out of the boat in the middle of a storm and start walking towards Jesus. How many people would have the faith to even start that? So Jesus isn't, isn't saying he doesn't have faith. He's saying, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? And when they were, and when they were come into the ship, the wind ceased. Then they were in the ship and worshiped him saying of a truth, thou art the son of God. Now this is a good verse for those that don't believe or to use with those that don't believe that Jesus is God. The fact that these guys worshiped him and Jesus didn't say, well, stop, stop. You're not supposed to be worshiping me. I'm just a man. But that's what he would have said if he was a godly man and he wasn't God and they were worshiping him, but they were worshiping him and he didn't stop them. So this is a good example. Uh, of a truth, thou art the son of God. And when they were gone over, they came into the land of Gennesaret. <laughs> Normally I don't pronounce that. Gennesaret. And when the men of that place had knowledge of him, they sent out into all that, that country round about and brought unto him all that were diseased and besought him that they might only touch the hem of his garment. And as many as touched were made perfectly whole. This should sound familiar to you because the woman of the issue of blood, that's 30 minutes, we're almost done. Who got the ball, ro ball rolling on this? And this is in uh, Mark 5, 25 through 34 that I'm reading. And a certain woman which had an issue of blood 12 years and had suffered many things of many physicians and had spent all that she had and was nothing bettered, but grew rather grew worse. When she heard of Jesus came in the press behind and touched his garment, for she said, she said in her head, 
if I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. Now, that words there, it means that she kept saying to herself. So she was repeating over and over to herself, that I may touch his clothes, I shall be whole. And straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, or that vir word virtue is dunamis, which means dynamite power, it means power, miraculous power. That's where we get the word dynamite, dunamis. I don't know why they use the word virtue or why they translate it into virtue, but uh, that's what it is. It's the word power, that power had gone out from him, turned him about in the press and said, who touched my clothes? So Jesus didn't even know that he didn't send the power out. The power was pulled out of him. And his disciples said unto him, Thou seest the multitude thronging thee, and sayest thou, Who touched me? And he looked around about to see her that had done this thing. But the woman was fearing fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. Now, the one reason that she was fearing and trembling was because the fact that she was unclean it meant she wasn't supposed to be in that crowd in the first place. Matter of fact, when she was walking around, she should have been, and if she got close to people, she should be shouting, unclean, unclean, because of her issue of blood. And she was actually a stoning offense, what she did, had done. Um, but the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. And he said unto her, Daughter, thy faith hath made thee well, thee whole. Go in peace and be whole of thy plague. So she was the one that knocked the the, the hole in the gate <clears throat> for uh, in the paddock. <laughs> I'll put a reference to that in there. Uh, the kingdom of heaven is taken by force. This is an example of the kingdom of heaven being taken by force. Uh, uh, and she she knocked the 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 paddock fence down, and the rest of the crowd is pouring through that fence here and besought him that they might only touch the hem of his garment. And as many as touched were made perfectly whole. So Jesus wasn't saying, okay, I'm going to heal you. I'm going to heal you. I'm going to heal you. No, it was not that. It was the faith of the people touching his garment was pulling the power to heal them out of Jesus without him, him even saying, uh, telling the power to go, just like the woman with the issue of blood. Very interesting stuff. It, 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 it flies in the face of what we're normally taught, how to believe in, in, uh, in Scripture. So that's Matthew, the end of Matthew 14. Next time, Matthew 15. You guys have a good day.